How we doing, church? Awesome. Great to be with you guys. There we go. There's some power. So good to be with you guys uh, this morning. Just a quick update on our family. We moved. Uh, anybody love moving? Anyone? Great. So we all agree. It's terrible. Uh, terrible process. And we got movers, so it wasn't like, you know, I'm out there doing all the heavy lifting, getting exhausted, but even like finding movers is a challenge because you go, you know, I go on Google Maps or Google and like movers in Waco, all the things, and how, who, how do I know, you know, who's good? I'm looking through reviews, and so I get these three estimates, right, and, and I'm looking at them, and, and at first, you know, of course... I want to go with the cheapest, but I'm trying to figure out like, all right, Lord, how do I make this decision? Well, one of them is, is clearly like a, a Christian company, if you will. It's like, you know, we moved the stone movers. And, and, uh, and so I'm like, you know, John 3, 16. I'm like, all right, I've, I'm like, there we go. We'll go with them. That's not really their name, by the way. And, and so uh, we, we enter into this process, right, where the, the day comes, we're going to move. And, and I've got a lot of grace for that job because it's a hard job. And they, they gave me an estimate of how long it would take and they got there at 9 a.m. Well, at 9 p.m., we're still putting boxes on the truck, right? And I actually have to drive to Houston this particular night because I'm speaking there the next day and, and I'm thinking, oh no, like this is going to go all night. But, it was, but it's all good because they said, hey, if we don't finish today, you know, we'll come back, we'll finish in the morning, great. And so we show up at the, the new place, the, the new guys in the neighborhood, you know, the two big diesel trucks drive down the street at 10 p.m. And, and I'm just thinking, this is not good. And so I, I'm there in the street and, and I'm talking to the, the lead person and I'm just like, hey, you know, this, I know this is taking longer than you thought. It's okay, but you, you gotta come back tomorrow. And he said, well, I can't come back tomorrow because I've already booked these trucks out tomorrow and so we, we have to go through the night and I'm like what, what do you mean like through the night is it probably 6 a.m. I like, no, man I gotta go to I gotta go to Houston can't leave my wife like you, you got to come back tomorrow you know that's what you said and he's like yeah but I, I, I know but I can't and I'm like but you don't understand you, you have to because that's what you said and then he and then and we're in this weird standoff I'm not gonna lie it's a little awkward right there in the middle of the street and he goes I thought you were a Christian because Monica had made the mistake of sharing the gospel earlier that day. <laughs> it's what she does, you know. And, and, and so I'm there, and I'm like kind of like caught off guard by that. And I'm like, I thought you were a Christian. And he's, he, he's like, I am. Look at my truck. Which begs the question, how do you identify someone as a Christian? Right? Like, is it... The ichthus on the car, the, the Hebrew word that nobody really knows what it means on the back of your neck or on your wrist, like the tattoo you got or something might be the mark of the beast and you don't realize it. Uh, I'm just saying, is it, is it the THM or the MDiv, the, the degree where you went to college, you grew up in church, the family name, the family of origin, what is the thing that you point to if you're trying to prove like, no, I am a Christian. I am a Christian, and so the thing that you look at, you're like, hey, look at that. Look at the degree on the wall. Look at the neighborhood I grew up in. Look, look at the tattoo. Look, I am a Christian. How does someone identify a Christian? We're in a little series, Family Matters, where we're spending just a few weeks talking about things that matter to this church family, and last week we talked about this idea of discipleship, like we can't let this mission that Jesus has given us die, that a disciple is someone who makes disciples. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And another word that we use for that is Christian. A, a Christian just means a follower of Christ. It has his name in the title. That's the label that we claim. But what makes someone a Christian? That's what I want to talk about with you guys today is how does someone identify a Christian? And the Bible's so clear. It's so kind to us. Clarity is kindness. God's like, hey, you don't have to wonder. I'll tell you explicitly, I'll tell you so clearly. 
he gives us John 13, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. He says, let me give you the answer to the trivia question. The thing that you should point to in that circumstance to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, is love. And this verse, it says it so clearly, it's really repeated all throughout the teachings of Jesus. But here's the problem. We throw that word around like it's the. Because we love chocolate, and we love coffee, and we love Baylor, and we love mama, and we love apple pie. We love all the things. And Jesus, when he says, they will know you by the way you love, he's not saying they're going to know you by the way you feel. He's talking about something that you do, the way you live your life. The way that your belief in him infiltrates all of the decisions that you make. And I know, I know this is like Christianity 101 so basic. But it's crazy how far we've gone. How far we've moved from this reality. Like we don't realize it anymore. I want to be abundantly clear on something. Out the gates. You are saved. Saved to God, saved from hell. You're going to be in heaven because of what you believe. And that is the gospel. That Jesus Christ has died for your sins on the cross. And the power of God, his Holy Spirit, raised him from the dead on the third day. And if you believe that he died for your sins, then you don't have to pay for your sins in hell. You don't have to suffer for your sins. And it's binary. You either believe that or you don't. You're saved or you're not. You're not kind of Christian, sort of Christian, moving toward Christian. Uh, you're you know, becoming a Christian. You are one or you're not one. And if this seems like basics, I have been running this lifelong experiment, adult lifelong experiment, where I ask somebody every day, how certain are you that you're a Christian? Between one and 10, 10 being certain, one being not so sure, if you died today, how certain are you that you would go to heaven? And in Waco, the, the answers that I get are five, six, seven, four, eight, nine. And the second question that I ask is if you stood before God and he said, why should I let you in? What would you say? And in Waco, the answers that I get to that question are, because I've been good, because I've loved him, because I went to church, because I have something on my truck. They, they'll point to something that they've done. Almost, I don't want to overstate, almost every day. So how has this simple message of Christianity been diluted. Because if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins, you're going to be with God forever. And it all comes down to the way you believe, or what you believe rather. But what you believe will impact the way you behave. Always, let me say it again. You're saved by what you believe but what you believe, if you really believe it, will impact the way you behave. Because it's very simple to say, I believe. Like we can identify as anything, especially in 2021, we're seeing this. I, I can identify as a different gender, different sex, different age. I can identify as all kinds of things different from the reality of what I am. And the world is, embraces this reality. And it's never been a greater grievance to God than when someone says, I identify as a follower of Jesus, but I don't follow Jesus. I just want you to know that in title and in name, I'm a Christian. Nothing in my life is impacted by that label, but I'll use it because I'm American. Raised in the Bible Belt. This is where I am. And so how do you know 
if someone is a Christian, what identifies them? Jesus said it's love, repeatedly. He said that's the thing. And so last week we talked about the Great Commission. This week we're going to talk about the Great Commandment and a value that I want to heat for our family, just this idea that Christians are marked by love for God, we are marked by love for others, and then before you leave here this morning, what is the dress code of a Christian? We kind of hinted on that yesterday, I mean last week, what's the dress code of a Christian? So let me set up this text, I'm going to be in Matthew 22, that's where you find the great commandment. And the scene is amazing. So like, even if you're like, oh yeah, I know the great commandment, I'm not so sure you understand the context of what's happening because this is an awesome scene. Jesus is there, he's teaching, and there's these two religious groups. There's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees, they're like your, your really strict Jewish sect of people, okay? That's the Pharisees, the guys with the funny hats. The Sadducees, the Pharisees believe in miracles, the Sadducees do not. They're the, they're the OG cessationist, if you understand that word. The, the Sadducees do not believe in the miracles of God, they do not believe in the resurrection, you can remember this, because Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection, they are therefore Sadducee. Uh, that, that's free, okay? So they're there. And Jesus is teaching, and it just turns into this weird showdown. You've seen this, like this debate where the, the profs like raise up and like, no, let me tell you, that verse doesn't mean that, and this is what's true about God, and, and, it, and they're just going back and forth. And the Pharisees start it. They say, they come up to Jesus like, hey, yeah, no, you talk about like honor people and stuff, right? What about taxes? Who, who are we supposed to pay taxes to? And Jesus is like, like, really? Like, this is the best you got? I don't know. Let me see a denarii. Whose face is on it? They're like, Caesar's? Cool. Give to Caesar's what is Caesar's. Hashtag burn. You know? And then the, and then the Sadducees are like, okay, okay, uh, okay. So this guy, he believes in the resurrection. He's talked about that. Uh, Jesus, I, I know that Moses said that if you know, a man dies that his brother should care for his widow. So what if there's a man who has a wife and seven brothers and he dies and then his other brother marries her and he dies and his other brother marries her and he dies and his other brother marries her and he dies and, his other, and they go all the way down to seven brothers in the resurrection in heaven. Whose wife is she? And Jesus is like, that's the best you got. He's like, who said anybody was married? in heaven. And then the Pharisees are like, ooh, 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 you know. And so then they raise up, and that's where we're at right now. <laughs> Verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, they get their best right now. Hey, come on, come here, Mike, tell them. And tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says this, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, you know this, but I don't think you understand how brilliant of a move that was. Because quite literally, the Pharisees followed 613 commands. And Jesus summarizes those 613 commands with two commands, which are really one command, okay? Love God, love people. The one command is love. And if you do this, all the do's and all the don'ts will take care of itself. Does that make sense? Like if, if you change your perspective to how much can I love God and love others in this circumstance, all the 613 decisions or, or rules that you have to follow, we'll take it, we'll do it. Well, can we watch rated R movies? Love God and love people and do whatever you want. Well, can I listen to Travis Scott? Love God and love people and do whatever you want. I got one Travis Scott fan in the, in the crowd. That's fine, that's whatever, okay, that was for you. All right, so the first point, followers of Jesus are marked by love for God. 
Followers of Jesus are marked by love for God. Now, if I was just going to camp here, which I will at some point, but I can't this morning, we would talk about what does it mean heart, soul, and mind, like he says here in Matthew. Mark 12 and Luke 10 add strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We know because we have the full picture of what Jesus said in all of the Gospels that he would have said those four words. And so what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart? What does it mean to love him with all your mind and your soul and your strength? Strength. That's what we would camp. But this morning, I'm going to summarize that as just with your whole being and everything you do. But we're not talking about a feeling. I don't know. If you, have you guys ever heard this song? This is, I'm gonna, just really going to. Uh, we'll just kind of break out in it every now and then in the car. It's kind of big a couple years. It's like, uh, uh, you, uh, I love God. You don't love God. What's wrong with you? All right, just me. Okay, I was going to try that this morning. Didn't go well. We'll strike that for the next one. But we'll just sing that song in the car, right? It's a great video. YouTube it later. She's, it's, it's really fun. But what about when you don't love God? What about when you're not feeling it? Like you're looking at something in your life that's really hard, and you're like... You did this. Dear friend of mine, not just name dropping, like someone I've done life with for a number of years, released an album this week. And so we went and celebrated that. And the album was really born out of the death of her father two years ago. And that sent her to a deep spiral of depression and major OCD where she had to get professional help. And and she would tell you, I was was really, really scared. And she had none of the feels, none of the love for God, but she just started writing songs. But these songs aren't happy songs. These, These songs are like, who else do I have to blame but you? There's a lyric. And they're just cries out to God. They're, they're laments of the heart. And so I called her and I just said, hey, what about when someone doesn't feel love toward God? That's where you've been. I, I see the product of your work. What would you say? And she said a lot of things, but I would summarize our longer conversation to say, she said, but you can still obey him. And just remember that he is the God of your emotions. So if you don't feel something that you want to feel toward him, ask him to change that. And she said, stay away from these accusations of yourself like, I should feel this way. Why don't I feel this way? She says, those are just spirals into the pit. And I, I agree with her. Don't, you don't need to say, well, why don't I feel this way? So let's just take her advice because the first thing that she said is absolutely biblical. What does it look like to love God? God, if you really loved us, you would have answered that clearly in the Bible. First John 5, verse 3. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. So when he says, love God, and we use the Bible to to help us understand what that command means, he comes back and says, and here's what I mean by that. To love me is to obey me. It's to, to know what I've asked of you and to do what I've asked of you, right? And I love that she says that he's the God of your emotions. The most joyful person that I know, the most joyful person that I know today, and I benefit from their joy tremendously, had a really difficult upbringing. Uh, Her her father took his life when she was a child, which really began a difficult journey uh, of trying to find a place in this world. And she was extremely bitter mean, lack joy. And she said, you know, I just started praying, God, would you give me joy? 
every day, God, would you give me joy? God, would you give me joy? And, and now I see the benefits of those prayers that she prayed throughout her life. And I'm telling you, she holds the title as the most joyful person that I know. And so we're talking about love and we're saying that love looks like obedience to God and that with that obedience comes the emotion of joy. Can I show you in the scripture? John 15 verse nine. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you, love. Now remain in my love, love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Okay, so this is, this is ideas repeated. Love for God looks like obeying his commands, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And so we see this idea of love, obedience, joy. Love, obedience, joy. Love, obedience, joy. You lack joy, the outcome, the outpouring of joy, that the symptom of joy. Let's backtrack. Have you been obedient? Does obedience mark your life and has your motive been love? Is that the, the lens with what you see the world through? Or have you turned towards selfishness? Got so focused on yourself, so focused on your own happiness that you start searching for your own happiness and you never find joy because joy is born out of a life of service to others. Losing your life to serving God and serving others. And he went first, guys, the next verse in this passage, and my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Because I think you and I are so worried about getting ripped off. Well, yeah, I'll love somebody, but what if they take advantage of me? We take advantage of God all the time. He gave his son for you. He went first. Greater love has no one than this. But God demonstrated his love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his love. God went first. He gave the greatest thing so that you can give, right? We can follow in that. We love because he first loved us, scripture says. If you're at this place where you don't feel love for God, Will you just make sure you know what you do that makes you love God more? You try with me, like, what is it that you do that makes you love God more? And I'll ask people this often, and they'll give me answers like, oh, you know, read the Bible, go to church. I'm like, man, that's, that's cool. Good for you. That's not me. Like, reading the Bible in the morning does not make me love God more. Sometimes it feels like a homework assignment. I mean, I, I really don't like to read much of anything. But man, sitting with friends who love him and, and talking theology, talking shop, man, that moves my heart towards him. Really talented people that I know that he's created and he's fine-tuned some skill in them to do something that others can, would be tempted to worship them, but they can point that worship to him. And there's something in that. When I see a really gifted person, it just brings me, I have a really emotional response. I'm weird like that. I don't know, but that's me. I know it's probably not you, but that makes me love God more. A walk in nature when the sun's cracking through the trees and, and the breeze and I feel all the things of creation and I hear the birds and the insects and the leaves crumbling underneath my feet. There's something about that moment that just moves my heart toward God and a bubble bath. <laughs> Just being real. Just keeping it real. There's something about having to sit still away from technology where I can let all my thoughts bleed out and just begin to focus on God that moves my heart towards him. That's what it is for me, probably not for you. You need to know the answer for yourself. What makes you love God more? And do a whole lot of that. But he says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The second one is like it. The greatest commandment, it's two commandments wrapped up in one. My second point, followers of Jesus are marked by love for others. Followers of Jesus are marked by love for others. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. 
which is to put others' interests first. There are people in your life right now that are really hard to love. Uh, it could be a neighbor whose dog never stops barking, or maybe you're the neighbor whose dogs never stops barking and they're just always on you and you're like, why don't you love Fluffy like I love Fluffy, right? It, there's something, there, there, maybe it's family, right? Maybe it's someone in your life where your, you, your personalities just great each other and you don't enjoy being around them. There's someone in your life that's difficult to love and then there's someone in your life that's easy to love. You enjoy them, like y'all just click. When you're together, you go, you go deep or you stay shallow, but it just seems exactly like what you need all the time. They're just really easy to love. You do anything for them. They're kind, right? So when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, who's your neighbor? And Jesus answers this question by putting someone in the story that his listeners would have hated. They would have had a prejudice against the person that he puts in the story and says, this is your neighbor. Jesus is saying, when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, he's saying, love those who are really difficult to love in the same way that you care for yourself, but he's not talking about an emotion. I think we've read this for so long and think, oh, I'm supposed to feel some emotion toward them. Jesus is talking about an action. In the same way that you would provide and meet the needs of yourself, you do this for those that you don't want to. So let's define love here so that we can have a definition for the rest of the morning before we wrap up inconveniencing yourself for the good of someone else. Let's define it like that. Love, here, is inconveniencing yourself for the good of someone else. To do something kind, to do something good for someone else at the inconvenience of yourself. You probably have heard there's multiple words for love in the scripture. So in, in the Greek, we have phileo, which is the friendship kind of love, like you love a friend, phileo. Uh, you have eros, which is um, the romantic kind of love. It's where we get the word erotic, eros kind of love. And you probably have heard the word that, that Christians, or that defines how Christians love is what? Agape, that's right. A lot, if you've been in church long, you've heard that word, agape. We agape uh, each other, the, or the love that we have is agape. But here's what you may not know that I find so interesting and rarely hear this taught anywhere. That word agape, it didn't exist. It started in the verb form, agapeo. Agapeo was the way that you would describe what a mother would do for her child. You've seen this, like the way that a mom can just like go without sleep and, and go without food and do anything to like care for this little human being that can do nothing in return and doesn't sleep. And anyways, uh, um, that's agapeo. That's that kind of love. And, and everyone knew that kind of love is this sacrificial kind of love. It's like where you give something and you expect nothing in return. Agapeo. That's what that was. When, when they're translating the Hebrew Bible, they get to this place where they're trying to describe how Christians, the way, love each other. And they take this verb word, agapeo, and they, they create, the first time we see it is in the Septuagint, the Greek Bible, this word agape. It didn't exist, but they're like, how do we describe how a Christian loves everyone. Well, it's kind of like the way that a, that a mom loves a baby. But that's kind of how they treat everyone. This, they, they weren't called Christians then. They were just called the way. They followed Jesus. They were followers of the way. They were like, how do we describe the way the way loves? It's this crazy, sacrificial, like giving of self, expecting nothing in return kind of love. Agape, and that word is born. And what an apologetic of the faith that until that moment, no one had ever loved like that, except in the context of close family. And they're like, but this is how they love everybody. Have we lost that? Have we lost that somewhere along the way? It seems to me that we have. So I think our issue is like we don't know how to love. We, we love out of our own conveniences and biases. 
I was on a call with the mayor two days ago. Hard situation here in Waco. Hospitals are full. Morgues are full. They're, they're renting refrigerated trucks to put bodies of those who've died in COVID. I had no idea. I didn't even know. I felt so naive on the phone call. I was like, gosh, I didn't know. No elective surgery right now? Like if you need a, if, an elective, I'm not talking about like plastic surgery. I'm talking about you need, you tore your ACL. Sorry. You're walking with a limp for a little while. We got nothing. You have a heart attack right now in Waco. They're going to send you somewhere else. What? I didn't even know. I didn't know. And so we're, we're on this call and we're trying to figure out how to navigate this. And, and so we're talking about vaccines. And listen, let me tell you something. I believe that the Holy Spirit can convict one Christian that, that they should get the vaccine. And I believe that the same Holy Spirit can convict another Christian that they should not. Like I believe that's in the realm of possibilities. That the Holy Spirit, God, could, could do that because of some unique situation that we don't know. I, we, I don't know why he would do that. I just believe that it's possible that he would do that. And so what we do is we have these really strong opinions that, that we project on others, which, which is fine. Like it's fine if you campaign your cause. Like you, you, this is your field of expertise and you want them to know, or you've, you've studied about the, the harms and the dangers and you're trying to tell the world, but when you villainize the person on the other side of the fence, you have moved away from love. Don't do that under the banner of love. It's not love. When, you, when your heart has turned toward them, you're no longer fulfilling this commandment. Right? Right? Does that make sense? So Harris Creek, Harris Creek, friends, followers of Jesus. Like, like let's make sure that in, in this really difficult time where people are doing the best they can, that the way that we communicate pushes people closer to Jesus and not further from them. Does that make sense? If we can help you, we want to. Like we have a panel of experts here that would love to talk with you and not try to convince you to get a vaccine or try to convince you not to, but really just give you information that would educate you. If that's something you're interested in, email us, hello at harriscreek.org. Because really, we want this church to be known in this community as the one that just processes everything through the lens of how can we love people the most we possibly can. Does that make sense? I know that's really uncomfortable for some of you, distracting for some of you. You're like, I wonder where he stands, what his view is. Ask me, I'll be right up here afterwards. Happy to talk with you, I got nothing to hide. But don't let that distract you from God's word. Okay, that's, that's what I'm giving you right now is the word of God, love your neighbor, as yourself. I don't know if you're aware of this, but God has used global pandemics in the past to explode Christianity. Did you know that? I've read this to you a couple times, but it's interesting because I haven't put it in front of you since the pandemic that we're in. But in the second and third century, there are about 5,000 people are dying in the Roman Empire a day. 5,000 people, bodies are, are piled up in the streets. Bodies are piled up in the streets. And, and this, is, this is documented. This comes from Rodney Stark, ironically, a, a Baylor prof now, uh, in his book, The Rise of Christianity. This is what he says. At a time when all other faiths were called to question, the whole Christian community became a virtual army of nurses providing for the basic needs of the suffering community. And then he quotes Dionysius. So he's a, a second century bishop Right, and, and so these are not like the words of some journalist today. These are words of, a, of an observer, an eyewitness then. This is what he says. Christians, the, the followers of the way, showed unbounded love and loyalty, loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy. Do you see the joy? If you're missing joy, do you see where it comes from? For their they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. 
cheerfully, cheerfully accepting their pains. They're like coming up to people and saying, hey, what do you have to give me in exchange for care for you? Oh, just a disease that's gonna kill me? Deal. I'll take that trade with joy. And that seems so crazy to us. We're like, that's so far from where we are at. But in a global pandemic, when the values of Christianity were hot, right? What happened in the midst of that pandemic is people moved closer to Jesus. Are people moving closer to Jesus because of how you are living in the midst of a global pandemic? Is that happening in your life right now? Or are you so wrapped up in you? Which is, I mean, here's why that's a bad idea. It's going to bring deep depression, misery, anxiety, OCD, um, narcissism. That's what's going to come your way. I've just seen it. I've done pastoral ministries too long. I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on. I just can't sleep. I just can't sleep. I, you, you, you think about you all the time. They were just following the way of their leader, Jesus, who said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And here we see the dress code of Christianity. This is what I want you to wear. And that's my third and final point. Just love is the Christian's uniform. That's what we're talking about today. Like love is the distinctive, it's how you are distinguished, it's how you are identified. Love is the Christian's uniform, it is what we wear, this is how we're seen. It, it, lime trees produce lime fruit, banana trees produce banana fruit, Christian trees produce the fruit of the spirit which starts with what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Love, I don't think it's on accident that it comes first. Because from love comes joy. Love is patient. Love is kind. Keeps no records of wrongs. It does not boast. It is not envious. It is not self-seeking. Right? It's not accident that the fruit of the Spirit that's named first is love. Christian trees bring forth love. I was raised on a farm, country, 4-H and FFA. And so when I was a young boy, um, about seven, six or seven years old, we would go to the Houston Livestock Show. I mean, that was a good time, you know, because they've got carnival rides and food that's bad for you and all the things. And so I really loved going to the Houston Livestock Show. And on this particular excursion, like I said, I'm about seven years old. I'm walking with my family. We're all together walking through the midway in, in the carnival and like there's the Ferris wheel and all the lights and it's nighttime and there's the, the zipper, this ride that was terrifying to me and, and there was just, just all these, all the bells and all the ringing and all the crowds. I mean, there's, there's like seven trillion people there and, and, uh, and I'm there with my family. We're having such a great time and, and as a six or seven year old, I look up and they're nowhere to be found. And at first I panic and I run forward around the corner trying to find them and don't see them. So then I run back to where I was thinking maybe I just stay here, right? And then it takes about 17 seconds for utter despair to sink in. I'm like, I'm never gonna see them again. Like I'm now gonna live in an orphanage the rest of my life. And when that was real, mom and dad, thank you. You know, that's just how you think when you're a kid. Like, I'm just like, I'm done. I remember backing up, vivid. I mean, it's still traumatizing. Backing up against this brick wall, looking at all of these people going by, thinking, all right, which one of you guys wants to be my new mom and dad, you know? <laughs> and then I remember my dad told me, once upon a time, if you get lost, find a police officer. Find, find, look for the badge, look for the uniform. And so in the midst of all of these people that are all wearing different things, I tried to find the one that was wearing something that stood out from the rest who I knew could help me. And so I did. 
And I just, I, I went up to them and in the midst of the tears, in the midst of the panic, I just got out the two words, I'm lost. I'm like, okay. And then it was their assignment to get me where I needed to, to find my parents. What I'm trying to tell you is there's people all around you who are lost and they're looking for someone who can help them find the way. Whether they know it or not, maybe they've moved to this place of despair in their hearts where I'll never find the way, but you get to show them if, if you are identified. They're trying to find someone who they can identify that would show them the way and they're not looking for a Hebrew tattoo, an ichthus, an MDiv, or a THM. You tracking? And so in summary, followers of Jesus are marked by love for God, which is obedience to him. Love for others, which is inconveniencing ourselves for their good. And love is our uniform. Love is our uniform. We're renting a house right now. The way that this came about, when we moved to Waco, we purchased a lot. We were, the plan was to build on this lot. Uh, we began to enter into that process. Building costs skyrocketed. And we've been since trying to figure out if we can move forward or not on that. Uh, in the midst of that, somebody put a contract on our house, uh, which enabled, like, freed us up to be able to make those decisions. And so we moved into a rental, a Harris Creek family said, hey, we have to move away for, for a year. You can rent our house for a year. And so that's what we're doing. And as, as we're in their home, they're taking down all of their things. And I'm like, hey, don't do that. We're just gonna be here for a year. Like, leave your stuff up. Like, you're gonna be back here in a year. And they were, so specifically, they had this photo wall of all of these pictures. And then they start taking them down. And I'm like, hey, you don't have to take them down. And she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, man, that's your, you're gonna be back in a year. She's like, it's gonna be weird. You're looking at our family. I'm like, no, it'll just remind us to pray for you and thank God for you that you lent your house to us. You know, it's, it's gonna be awesome. They're like, okay. And they're moving too. Like they're in the craziness of moving, you know? They, they, they're trying to get all their stuff to, to College Station. And so uh, all of the craziness of moving comes in and we start taking boxes to our rent house and we're walking through it and my daughter Presley goes, hey, that's us. I'm like, what do you mean? And I start looking in all of these frames. They had went and printed pictures of us off my Instagram account, professionally printed pictures and filled all the frames in the house with our pictures in the midst of them moving. And I know that probably seems so small to you. It literally, in the midst of the chaos, took my breath away. I stood in the living room, I, I, can't, I can't breathe. I'm so moved by that act of kindness. I cannot believe they did that in the midst of their move. When did they have the time? I'm just asking, when is the last time you inconvenienced yourself? for the good of others. And by inconvenienced yourself, I mean in the ways that do not come natural to you. Because some of you, it's natural to lend. Some of you, it's natural to, to, to send a note. It's natural to do these in the ways that are hard. And so that's, that's your assignment this week. So we sing this song, think of someone that you're going to inconvenience yourself for their good in the name of Jesus. And let it just be a step in the direction that you're gonna to continue to walk. Because the one that you follow inconvenienced himself in the most heinous of ways for your good. We pray. Father, we do love you. Thankful for your word, for your example and your son. for all the things that you've done for us. God, I just confess this word love has become benign to me. I've just seen it too much. I've heard sermons like this too much. I've read books on the topics too much. And, and I really see a problem in our church and, and not just Harris Creek, Lord, but, but the church in America, it just seems like we've forgotten how to do this. We've, we've defined it in different ways. It, it's. We just need help to walk that line of being a place that speaks the truth, that stands on God's word, but is the most inviting place that, you, that we could ever imagine. 
And that's going to take a miracle, God. I just, I believe in my heart. We will not be able to do that without a sovereign act of your Holy Spirit, your kindness. But you are love. And so let us love one another because you are love. Amen.